and you can take it from here. Thank you, Jackie, for that wonderful introduction. Are you able to hear me well? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Today, our workshop is on procurement fundamentals. You will be getting a general overview of what procurement is at the city of Chicago and how to do business with the city. As Jackie mentioned, I am an attorney with the Department of Procurement Services. On the screen, you can find my email address, or if you like, you can always email Jackie if you have questions that they're not answered at the end of the workshop, and we'll be able to either direct you to the right person or answer your questions. Here's a outline of what we'll discuss today. First, we'll cover the mission statement of the city of Chicago. Um, then we will inform you of the laws that govern the procurement process, the Illinois state statute and the Chicago municipal code. We will learn um, some very commonly used procurement terms, the types of procurement that the city receives or issues, and also certification. We'll touch briefly on certification. Certification is its own workshop in itself, but we will go over the different types of certification. We will also briefly touch on contract monitoring and compliance, and that's basically what the city monitors or seeks to ensure you comply with in your contracting with the city. Programs and bid incentives, <coughs> excuse me, is also a separate workshop in itself, but it will list the different programs and incentives that we have. We will also talk about what things you can find on our DPS website, which is very helpful. Um, a lot of this information that you receive today can be found on our website, and we will take questions and answers at the end. It is our mission at the City of Chicago to work together as a team, and we desire to guarantee an open, fair, and timely process. And the way we do this is by establishing, communicating, and enforcing superior business practices. We do that because the Department of Procurement Services is the contracting authority for the city of Chicago for every goods and services that are purchased by the city and that are not um, authorized for departments individually. And integrity and public trust in the law are the principles that guide us. There are two laws that govern our process. One is the state statute, which is the Municipal Purchasing Act, and that's found at 65 ILCS. What ILCS refers to is Illinois Compiled Statutes, and that's Chapter 5, Section 8-10-1. And then we have the city's home rule authority under the city's Municipal Code of Chicago, specifically Chapter 2, Section 92 of that ordinance deals with purchasing. Some terms that you will hear often in the procurement process is contract. Contract is the ultimate agreement between the city and the vendor for the provision of its goods and services to the city. And there are a number of different forms of contracts where we will talk about those different types of procurement contracts um, that occur as a result of those different types of procurement. You will hear the term bid package in a competitive bid. And what that is, is just the entire set of documents that the issue that the city issues to the public to be in. And that the package ultimately becomes the contract once the vendor submits its proposal. We have addendums. What an addendum does is change the city's requirements for the invitation to be in or a request for qualification or a request for a proposal. And those are types of procurements which we refer to. An addendum is issued by DPS, which is the Department of Procurement Services, to everyone who picked up a bid package. It says picked up a bid package because originally when we were going pre-COVID, when we were going to the bid buying room, you could pick up a copy of the bid. Now everything is done, done online through e-procurement. So when you um, sign up for iSupply, you will automatically 
consent the agenda. The next term used is amendment or modification. Um, they serve the same purpose. They formally change the terms and the conditions of the contract. And there are several forms of amendments as well. One form you may hear if you deal in the, in the construction arena is a change for it. Types of procurement. We have small order contracts. We have competitive bids, requests for proposals, requests for qualifications, and our job order contract, which you will often hear us refer to as the job. In a small orders contract, those are when we are procuring goods and services under $100,000. If the bid on the contract would be over $10,000, then we have to have what we call NBE WBP compliance. That stands for Minority Business Enterprise and Women Business Enterprise. And we will touch on this more later. But what happens is the city assesses the goods and services that are to be provided to the city. They determine the percentage of minority and women firms that can participate on the contract either as a prime or a joint venture or a subcontractor, and they will establish certain contract specific goals that the prime contractor has to meet. And basically they have to and they have to subcontract out work to a certain percentage of minority and a certain percentage of women businesses. And that's a requirement under the contract. A competitive bid is a contract when we issue a formal bid solicitation. That solicitation dollar amount is either equal to or over $100,000. We advertise that in the paper, and we also advertise it on our iSupplier website. As I previously stated prior to COVID, you were also able to go to the bid bond room, which is located in City Hall in room 103. But now everything is being done online. The solicitation period, meaning the period that it will be advertised, can occur anywhere from 10 to 30 calendar days. In some of the solicitations, you may be required to um, pay a deposit. If you have to pay a deposit, it will state so on your bid documents that's in your bid package. Competitive bids have pre bid comps. That may include a site inspection if that's the type of work that the city is looking for after the pre bid meeting. They are optional, but they are also highly recommended that you attend. Why? Because during those pre bid conferences, you're able to review the specifications. If you have any questions or concerns, those questions or concerns can be answered at that pre bid conference. And also, as a result of questions and answers, there may be an addendum to the contract, or if it's not an addendum to the contract, it'll be a clarification issue to answer some questions. Please know that this is not the only period of time that you'll be able to answer questions. You also have a period of time during the bidding process, which is also outlined in your documents to submit questions to the procurement specialist but it is highly recommended that you attend the previous conferences. Right now, they have been held, uh, held virtually. If there is not a pre-bid meeting, as I was touching on, bidders are encouraged to review the specification and contract documents during the solicitation period, and then you reach out to the Department of Procurement Services Contract Administrator. That administrator will be listed on the bid documents or identified in the bid documents, as well as the advertisement that goes out. And that's who you reach out to regarding any questions that you have about the documents. When you bid on a city contract, you want to be sure that you read everything thoroughly, you fill in all required information, that you provide all the documentation that is requested. And certain bid documents have to be submitted and executed with the bid. If not, you can run into a problem where your bid ends up being rejected. You always 
always want to make sure you sign and execute the document and have it notarized. The bid bond or deposit may be required for some bids that will not exceed 10% of the contract amount and it has to be submitted in the proper form. Cash is not one of them. Um, if a deposit or, or uh, bond is required, again, the bid package or bid documents will say so. It is important that you remember that bids have to be submitted timely on the bid opening date or your bid check. Bids occur Monday through Friday, except the major holidays in City Hall be in a bar room, but again, everything is being done virtually or online, it's still be done in bid and bar room or read out loud. The bids are open, they're read out loud. The bids are tabulated. The bid tabulation and bid documents are then reviewed to ensure that they are complete and that they are accurate. You will be able to go online on DPS website 24 hours after the bid opening has been done to take a look at the bid tabulations, what has been bid on them. The way the award process works, after it's determined that the bids have been provided, they're accurate and complete, a determination has to be made regarding the bidder's responsiveness and responsibility. A competitive bid you will see in the documents is awarded to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. So when the bids come in, they are going to assess for responsiveness, they're going to assess for responsibility. A recommendation of award is then made. And if that bid is acceptable in all areas, that bid is packaged up. Those documents are routed for signature approval process. They're assigned by the Chief Procurement Officer, they're signed by the mayor, they're signed by the comptroller. That's what the signature approval process looks like. If there's a performance and payment bond, any insurance requirements, any federal funding agency requirements, if those are applicable, that information will be obtained as well. Our first type of procurement um, on, the, on the slide is request for proposal. The city uses a request for a proposal or RFP to solicit proposals to implement a new project that requires some sort of professional services. And the city uses that when there's no in-house technical experts or resources to actually implement the project or services. What's done in the RFP is in the scope of services, the city will list out their objectives and their scope, but it is not done in detail. We do not have every aspect laid out. That's because they'll be relying on the vendor's expertise. So the vendor will have to provide a proposal, a detailed proposal, providing the information that the city is requesting. And that information will be evaluated by an evaluation committee. And the evaluation is based on certain factors and criteria that will be outlined in the RFP. Unlike a competitive bid, it's not based solely on low price. So with an RFP, you'll have a proposal, you may not be the lowest bidder and still can be awarded the contract. Why? Because you have some other qualification uh, that the city prefers. So the contract in this case would go to the highest rated or rank. Request for a qualification or RFQ is a method the city uses to solicit qualifications from companies. You have to possess a high degree of, of technical expertise and knowledge in specific discipline areas. What the city does in an RFQ is they're going to pre qualify companies. So it'll be a group of vendors in a pool. And then the city in the future will issue task orders. Those pools of vendors will issue proposals to those task orders. And based on your proposal, the city will make a determination whether or not they want to accept that particular proposal or task order. Evaluation and selection in an RFQ is based on qualifications and technical competence. So if, you're, if it's determined that you're qualified, you will enter into the pool. 
you usually will see this in architectural and engineering RFQ. There's no proposed cost at the time. A fee schedule will be negotiated later once you enter into a master agreement with the city. There are also some categories of consulting services that the city may use the RFQ approach to. The job or the job or the contract, it is a type of competitive bidding. It's a firm fixed price indefinite quantity contract that's specifically designed for every city department's construction program. Its intent is to accomplish certain small and medium sized projects, not our larger construction projects, those would be bid out separately. So instead of bidding out every small or medium construction job and developing plans and technical specifications, the department uses the job. A general contractor would be solicited to respond to the job specification. And when you see a job specification, you will find a bid document where the city outlines what services it intends to use. The job includes a unit price book. And in that unit price book, there's various construction tasks with descriptions that have units of measure and also a unit price for every task in the job. Award is made to the general contractor that offers the most favorable adjustment factor against the price book. And the adjustment factor goes towards work performed during normal working hours and work performed during other than normal work. The value of the job contract really depends on what the department needs to be done and what they have budgeted for. So it can be. In every contract, the city requires an economic disclosure statement. In the economic disclosure statement, the vendor would disclose ownership. The vendor would also respond to certain questions that helps the city assess whether or not the vendor is eligible to do business with the city. And some of those things that um, come up are whether you're debarred, you know, there's questions regarding debt, there's questions regarding uh, criminal activity as it relates to the bidding process. And all of these things are things that the city know, needs to know because by ordinance, the city cannot do business with certain individuals and companies and individuals. Um, they are completed online and that is mandatory online for the most part. There may be certain solicitations for a paper economic disclosure uh, statement is allowed. Who's to complete it? The applicant for the contract has to complete an economic disclosure statement, as well as any legal entity which owns more than 7.5% interest, whether it's direct or indirect, in that applicant home. They also have to file an EPS. Certification. If you want to be certified as a minority firm under the contract, there is a certification process. We have six types of certification. We have minority owned business enterprise. We have women owned business enterprise. Business enterprises owned by people with disability. Disadvantaged business enterprise. Our airport concession disadvantaged business enterprise. Veterans owned business enterprise. But what's important to remember here is there's some basic eligibility requirements for all of them. The business has to be at least 51% owned and controlled by a qualifying member. And that goes to whether you're a minority, whether you're a woman, whether you have a disability, whether you're a disadvantaged or you're a better. That's what the qualifying individual refers to. You also have to be a small business, you have to be independent, and you have to be viable. The certification regulations are broken up into two parts. There's regulations for construction and there's regulations for non-construction. You can find those on our DPS website. They will define what it means or where you find information on what it means to be a small business. It will define what analysis is taken to determine whether you're independent and you're viable. How do you get MBWBE DBE participation on the contract? What regulations govern that is set forth right here. Section 292420 of the municipal code governs the city's minority-owned and women-owned business enterprise. 
section 292650 of the municipal municipal code governs minority and women-owned business enterprise procurement programs for construction. So the first one was um, non-construction for all other contracts that are not construction and then the second one is construction. The last one that's related to disadvantaged businesses is actually governed by federal regulations. CFR refers to Code of Federal Regulations. That was chapter 49, part 26. To be a minority or women-owned or other disadvantaged business on the contract, you have to perform a commercially useful function. What a commercially useful function is, is a certified firm performs a commercially useful function when it is responsible for the execution of a distinct element of the work of the contract, which is carried out by actually performing, managing, and supervising the work involved or fulfilling responsibilities as a joint venture. You actually have to take control and take the lead of that percentage of the contract that you are responsible for to be performing a commercially useful function. In the bid document or in the um, RFP document, you will find a section called special conditions. The special conditions will outline what percentage of minority or women with disadvantaged firms must be used on the contract. It will outline what a commercially useful function is. It will explain what it means if you need to have a reduction of those goals, what's required if you need a waiver of those goals, what is required, it will speak on good faith efforts. What does it mean to make a good faith effort to meet those goals? And we'll touch on that on the next slide. So a contractor cannot or shall not be entitled to a reduction or a waiver of those MBE WBB goals during the performance of the contract after they substantially completed the contract or at any time a contract closes out, unless that contractor has in writing requested from the CPO a reduction or waiver. And if a contractor is seeking a waiver or reduction of MBE or WBE goals, they have to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the CPO that they've made good faith efforts to meet the MBE or WBE reduction goal. And part of making a good faith effort means you actually have to reach out to firms on the contract, to firms to perform on the contract. Contract monitoring and compliance. There are some things that the city monitors in addition to whether or not you're meeting WBB or DBB compliance, you have to list all of those subcontractors on the compliance plan and the city does follow that and track that in the C2 system. We also, in certain contracts that has residency ordinance requirements and equal employment opportunity commitments, which you will find in the construction contracts, the city monitors those. What the residency ordinance requires is that if there's a construction contract and it's estimated at $100,000 or more, and it's funded by the city of Chicago, then 50% of your total work hours on that contract has to be performed by actual residents of the city of Chicago. And then 7.5% of total work hours has to be performed by project area residents. The equal employment opportunity is a canvassing. It's been to promote a quality of opportunity for minority and female personnel on our city funded construction projects. And it is determined based on award criteria determination. And it has to be inserted into each of those contracts that are estimated at $100,000 or more in city funds. What you do in the canvassing formula is you propose the minority or female journey workers employee utilization goals. There is a cap for canvassing purposes. However, the city does encourage you to more in actual performance. How do you achieve MBWB? You can be a prime, the MBWB, the prime on the contract, or 
a crime on the contract can join with the MBW working time. You can subcontract out a portion of the work to one or more MBW working time, or you can purchase materials that are used in the performance of the contract from one of the MBW working Reporting requirements. The prime contractors are responsible for submitting certain information. You have to submit monthly subcontractor payment certification form. You have to submit your weekly certified payrolls. Um, if waivers of lien, you have to submit that as well. They apply. The incentives and programs that the city has, the number of incentives and programs, and I'm not going to read them all out. But the way the incentive program works is that there are cer certain incentives where if you bid on a contract and let's just say you're a city-based manufacturer, under the city-based manufacturer regulations, it may say if they meet the requirements of a city-based manufacturer, a certain percentage should be used to assess their bid. Let's just throw out a number, for example, let's just say you get 2% of your, your, your bid. That doesn't mean that the dollar amount that you bid, that doesn't mean that you won't be paid your bid. What that means is it's going to be used in the assessment of whether or not you're the lowest bid. So the dollar amount that you bid, 2% will be taken off that dollar amount. What it does, it gives you an advantage. So maybe you're the second lowest bid. But now that you're a city-based manufacturer and they assess the 2% on your bid, now you have become the lowest bid. That's how the incentive program works. There are other um, programs in which incentive programs that you receive a credit after the performance on the contract. Once you receive that credit, you will be able to use that credit then to bid on future contracts. Some of the programs that we have is a small small business initiative construction program, which that only goes towards small businesses. We have the mid-sized business initiative program. We have our diversity credit program, the target market program. In the target market program, those uh, contracts are only issued to targeted, targeted entities, which would be minority, minority and women business enterprises are the only ones that can receive the target market program. Then you have the mentorship program. In the mentorship program, which is also an incentive program, is where the prime mentors firms to help them to develop, develop their skills and stand in the industry so that they can become an established business and hopefully graduate from the program. The prime can mentor a sub or another subcontractor can mentor. So our bid incentives, we have city-based manufacturer, as I mentioned, we have city-based business. City-based business assess whether you pay taxes here, you're licensed to operate here, the majority of your full-time workforce is here. It'll uh, assess whether your full-time workforce is in socioeconomically disadvantaged areas. We have our apprentice utilization program for returning citizens and help get them involved in contracts and working. Um, we have our project area subcontractor utilization. We have incentives to encourage utilization of MBEs and WBEs. What that means is you'll see a contract sometimes that has no stated goals. And that means that the Department of Procurement Services has determined that, you know, it's not enough minority or women firms that work in that particular area or it's not any that work in that particular area, but as much as you're able to use the kind of that contract to do so. A executive order was recently issued in council, executive order 2021-22, which requires enhanced report. So contractors have to submit projections as to when and what extent they will use certain certified firms. So now you just don't provide your compliance plan and say, I'm going to use these subcontractors. You have to submit a projection and say, this is when I'm going to use them, and this is to what extent I'm going to use them. You have to 
provide an explanation and recovery plan anytime the participation is below what your projected usage is. The next component of this uh, diversity reporting is diversity program. The city is looking to find out if the contractor has agreements with the city, um, including redevelopment agreements, required to submit annual reports of their business diversity program if they have one, or they have to submit something about their lack thereof if they don't. We need to include information as to the expenditure on goods and services from minority-owned firms and women-owned firms from prior calendar. And our procurement website. On our procurement website, we have some very valuable information. It's You can look up any contracts that have been awarded by the city. You can look up any modifications that were made to those contracts and detail what those modifications were. You can see what payments were made to vendors. You can see the bid tabulation related to certain contracts. Weekly, there's bid opportunity. You can see what's up and coming that you may want to bid on. If you're looking for minority and women-owned firms, there's a directory online. You can search for those firms. If you need to find detailed information about the various programs and incentives that the city has, those programs are explained in detail, the rules are provided, how they apply or how they might not apply to your firm. We have all our regulations on there. I mentioned the certification regulations, all information pertaining to our eye supplier and system. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jackie for any questions. Thank you, Brittany, uh, for that great presentation. And let me just um, piggyback on a point that uh, Brittany articulated, all of those various things that are on our website. And we do offer a uh, workshop that uh, takes you through um, that uh, information and where you can find it and you know, uh, how to click on and, and navigate uh, in that space. Uh, and actually, Rodney is the uh, facilitator of that uh, workshop. Uh, so, um, if you're interested, um, we will be having um, more workshops. Uh, we're almost at the end of our 2021 workshops, and we will begin our scheduling for 2022. But look out for the navigating the DPS website because you can find all of um, how to do that and great tips and information that Rodney gives uh, regarding that. Um, we do have questions. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your uh, screen, uh, those of you that have a question and would like to ask it, use the Q&A panel. You'll see Q&A there. If you don't see Q&A at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, click on the three dots, um, and then it should bring a menu up that says uh, Q&A. Click on that, type in your question in the box, press the enter key, and we will get it. The first question, I think, uh, Brittany, the person is asking, you're talking about bids, meaning con contracts over uh, 100K. Does this also include the small orders you mentioned earlier? So I think they're kind of talking about competitive bids versus small orders. So um, if you kind of want to uh, go back, you know, and elaborate through that if you want to, if you care to. Um, on that, or if you have some points to add to that, but they're asking, uh, when you were talking about the 100 K contracts, does it also mean small orders, um, as well? All orders contract is capped at 100,000. It cannot exceed that in any form. The difference between the small order and competitive bid other than that $100,000 cap is there's no requirement under the Municipal Purchasing Act or the Municipal Code to do any type of formal bid process. However, the city still does a bidding process similar to a competitive bid, but it's not for the same length of time. It's a shorter period of time. Um, 
the competitive bid is a hundred thousand or more. The small order is a hundred thousand or less. Great. Um, the next question I am uh, going to read, and I'll take the first stab at it, and then I'll give it to Brittany uh, to answer as well. I'm a new uh, DBE, MBE, WE firm. Is there a way to connect with larger prime uh, firms to be a subcontractor? And um, I, I, I wanted to take the first stab at it because generally we have outreach events. And uh, last year we had a few, but they were virtual. Um, and it, there weren't uh, as many where you could network with those. Uh, but generally, um, uh, when we have our in person vendor fair, we have an event called, and sometimes when we have our construction summit, we have an event called the uh, matching um, uh, process. And we will take larger firms and uh, partner. Smaller firms, I mean, you sign up for the firms you'd like to speak with, and you can get some gauge and opportunity to network and talk to these um, larger firms and um, show your wares and tell them what you do. I just will say um, if you do get that opportunity, because uh, a lot of the sister agencies and other agencies do that as well. Um, if you do get that opportunity to network, I just say be be ready and um, you know uh, with your uh, statements and you know that you have to have to introduce yourself and do your uh, thirty second elevator pitch because sometimes the sessions of networking is not very long and so um, we have to have folks move around. Uh, to various um, vendors. So if you get that opportunity, I would say be careful, uh, be um, prepared uh, to do that. Uh, we also have assist agencies, uh, which are agencies that we partner with, um, and they do some matching events as well. So I would say on my side of it is um, to look out for any of the outreach events um, that are, are given and then uh, the outreach events that have networking because we always give a chance for people to kind of uh, network with one another, um, whether it's virtual or in person. Um, so I would just say be beware of that. And I think on the 21st, um, BACP is having a networking uh, event. They're having a small uh, business Expo, where a lot of us that are within the city agency, um, their procurement uh, um, departments are going to be part of that uh, Expo, and we will all have booths. So you can come to the booths and ask your questions, and we can get answers for you. Now, I'll let Brittany uh, add to that for she might have some varied ideas on that question, but uh, I'll let her take it from here. <clears throat> With everything um, that Jackie said, she basically touched on everything. I would, there are some things that the the city consistently procures you know, services and goods that they, they don't change much over time. So you can take a look at the buying plan, you can see what they are seeking to procure. You can go on DPS's website and look up, you know, those contracts or similar contracts. You can see who has been awarded that contract over time. You can reach out to those companies and to get your name out there, let them know who you are. That's a good, good place to start as well. And also, um, reaching out to them because again, they, they have the mentor protege program. So when you see who those crimes are, you know, you can work with them. You can seek to be mentored while also subbing on the contract. That's a pretty sweet deal. It's not a forced relationship. It's something that you agree to if you want to, but it's a good experience 
Um, Jackie also mentioned the assist agencies. Um, not only do they host like vendor affairs of the city, but they enter into what we call service reimbursement agreements with the city. And under those service reimbursement agreements, their job is to provide certain services to the community, um, whether it's assistant agencies on um, how to become certified. Or sometimes it's about, you know, O'Hare 21 project, how to get uh, vendors on board for those projects, um, how to respond to city solicitations. So they are another great resource because they don't only have events, right? They do business with the city where they train the community in certain areas and how to do business with the city. So I really want to emphasize number one, seeing who vendors are with the city, reaching out to them, and number two, reaching out to the assist agencies. And, and like Brittany said, you can find a copy of the assist agencies in the buying plan in the back of the buying plan. They are all there. Um, the city's <laughs> website as well. Yes, oh, no. and, and, on the, and on our website as well. Um, does the city use the GSA schedule? Acronym stand for? I'm not sure. <laughs> they didn't put. They just said, "Does the city use?" So, if the person that wrote that, if they're still on, if you can tell us what GSA stands for, uh, we'll come back to that question in just a second. Uh, the next question is: Is there a contact person for the City of Chicago Mentor Protege Program? And uh, uh, that that's our next question. There's not a particular contract for the mentor protege program. What happens is when a prom bids on a contract, when they submit the bid on the contract, they also submit a mentor protege agreement. That mentor protege agreement comes through the procurement specialist that has the contract and is submitted to the department's legal um, unit to review. And if it's approved, the prime and the sub will receive a um, notification from the city that it, the relationship has been approved. Uh, did yeah, she just answered that. Uh, the person put, is there a contact person, not contract? She just answered that. There is not a contact person uh, for the city of, of Chicago mentor protege uh, program. It is, um, uh, you know, one of our programs that we offer, but there is information that we give on our website in those uh, resource guides that I explained. Uh, programs and ex incentives, you can get more information there, but it isn't a person that is um, over that program to give uh, you or you can contact for that. I uh, guess the answer to that question, Jackie, is they, I mean, if there's a particular question, they can contact DPS legal about the program, but like the way the program works, if the question is how it works, then you know the prime would pull the mentor protege um, agreement and submit it with its bid. And there's a section in the bid that says whether you have a mentor protege uh, relationship. And at the time of bid submission, if the contract is to be awarded to that of vendor, then that's when he feels he will actually review the relationship and approve. But if it's just that you want more information or how it works, again, it's on DPS's website, or you could contact me or someone else at DPS if you just want to know more about the program. Uh, and if uh, Desi is still on, if you can tell us what GAS schedule is, uh, I mean, you know, what is the GAS? 
I mean, GSA, I'm sorry, GSA uh, schedule. If you can tell us what the GA, uh, GSA stands for. Um, oh, she did right. Uh, the General Service Administration schedule. She's asking, does the city of Chicago, uh, does the city use uh, the GSA schedule, which is general service administration schedule? And she's saying, is but a I, I, I will consult her. Is a long term government wide contract with commercial companies that provide access to millions of commercial products and services at fair and reasonable prices to the government. Say that again. It's a. Uh, uh, are you in your I, I can't see your screen with the Q and A on it. I'm seeing a chat now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, general uh, services basically is a long term government wide contract with commercial companies that provide access to million uh, millions of commercial products and services at fair and reasonable prices to the government. I'm not aware that we use that, but I will discuss that in turn. So D Desi, if you just want to um, email Brittany, um, you know, personally uh, at Brittany.Mason at cityofchicago.org, she will be happy to follow up on that for you. Uh, are there any additional questions that anyone may have before we close? Um, well, while, while I'm giving the last few minutes uh, so that everyone um, is uh, able to ask their question, I want to thank our guest, Brittany Mason, for coming on and telling us uh, how we can do business with the city and giving us a few procurement fundamentals of how to go about this process of securing um, bids and how the Department of Procurement Services looks at the process as well. Um, I do want to thank all of the attendees for coming today. Uh, we appreciate you trying to um, get more information on this process. And I say, if you uh, have heard the information today and you at this particular time uh, are not able to take uh, advantage of that, uh, share it with someone else that you know that is in business and tell them where they can come get information uh, to do business with uh, the city of Chicago. We want to make sure that we have information out there that gives everyone the access to participate uh, and to do business with the city of Chicago. And if we can help you do that, that's what we are here to do. So uh, I, at this time will say, I don't see any further questions. Rodney, do you have any that was sent to you? If I don't see anything pop up from Rodney at this time, I will say, um, it's here, everyone stay safe, stay well, uh, wash your hands, social distance, wear your mask, get your shots, get your booster shot if you're eligible, um, do whatever you need to do um, so that we can be in those uh, in-person areas so that we can um, network with you and give you information on how you can be a part of any of the government uh, contracts that we might have. Thank you so much for attending today. And uh, you all have a great uh, rest of your day and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you, Brittany.
Have a wonderful day, everyone else.